Hey folks, George here, uh, to talk about another work of Japanese literature called My Individualism. It's an essay by Natsume Soseki, uh, in about, written in about 1914, originally given as a speech to uh, students at Gakushuin University. In addition, of course, to talking about all the main questions that I typically ask, who are the characters, what's the setting, what's the plot, what are the themes? I'm going to focus most on what are the themes today. Uh, we're also going to talk a bit about the uh, formal structural analysis of the work, intertextual connections, history of the work, and of course, connections to myself. I think we have to really start with the history first. Let's start with the history first, because we have to put this in context. Now, this is the Meiji era. What makes the Meiji era interesting? In Japan. The Meiji era is the ushering in of modernity or the mo first modern era of Japanese history. Prior to that, in the pre modern eras, uh, many scholars would suggest that Japan was a feudal society. And of course, with the Meiji era, the society changed into a modern society. We'll talk a little bit about what that means. First thing, politically speaking, it changed from a feudal society to a democracy right, a Western-style democracy. From the 1100s or so up until 1868, so uh, 1100s, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 700 years, Japan had ultimately been ruled by the shoguns, who are military leaders. The emperor was not a very uh, formidable figure in much of that 700-year history. Either it was shoguns or the regents behind the shoguns who really held and exercised political power. So what happened to change the power of the shoguns, specifically the Tokugawa shogunate who had ruled from at least uh, from around the early 1600s? Well, in 1852, an American named Matthew Perry sailed his black ships, black, big black steamships, into uh, Japan ultimately said, open up Japan, because the Tokugawa shogunate had closed Japan, closed Japan off from foreign influence and from foreign powers. Open up Japan so we could sell you our good old-fashioned American products. This, of course, scared the Japanese because having been closed off, uh, Japan was quite a bit further behind, technologically speaking, from America and the Western European powers. What a sight it must have been to see Matthew Perry sail up in giant black steamships where the Japanese were still on wind power or manpower ships, right? And weren't really going into ships much at all anyway, since they couldn't leave Japan. And so Japanese society got scared and Pol the, those in political power decided the shoguns have obviously kept us behind, held us back. Well, we need to overthrow the shoguns and bring back the emperor. After all, this is why Japan, so the excuse went, this is why Japan fell behind because the, show, uh, because the emperor, the rightful ruler of Japan, hadn't ruled. Well, even under the Meiji era, it wasn't exactly the emperor who uh, exercised total power. There were a lot of uh, folks behind the scenes, so to speak, pulling strings. What's interesting about the Meiji Revolution is that it, many scholars call it a relatively bloodless revolution. Now, there certainly war battles and skirmishes, uh, especially those who uh, wanted to stay and keep the old ways. However, compared to the French Revolution, compared to the Bolshevik Revolution, Compared to the American Revolution, the Meiji Revolution was ultimately a bloodless upheaval for the most part, and society transitioned in a fascinating way. So with that in mind, the questions that are really going to uh, stick with us now, that we're really going to focus upon, and by the way, these aren't just questions for Meiji era Japan. I think these are questions for all of us, even in the year 2020. These questions are, what is modernity? What does it mean to be modern? What comes with modernity? Technology. What is my relationship with technology? 
What is society's relationship with technology? What is my relationship and society's relationship with science? A modern development. What is my relationship and society's relationship with enlightenment ideals that ultimately came from Europe? Enlightenment philosophy, which in, of course uh, influence the political values that modernity uh, brings, especially in Japan and other places as well. What are some of these idealistic uh, enlightenment political values? Well, democracy for one, liberty for another, individualism, which we'll talk about today. So the questions really, if we even take that a bit further, are what does that mean about me and my place in society? What does that mean about my role in society? What does that mean about my role with myself? How do I identify myself? What's interesting to me is that these questions are just as prescient today in 2020 as they are in Meiji, Japan. And I think that since time immemorial, in fact, people have been asking themselves very similar questions. So now we're just going to be asking these questions uh, in the context of Japan during the Meiji era, but I think we're going to be asking these questions uh, with every work of literature that we might examine, whether it's a Japanese work of literature or an English work of literature or a Russian work of literature or Chinese literature. These key questions should always be in the back of our minds and will stay with us and will inform how we engage with so many of these texts. Now let's talk about the characters. Well, the character obviously is going to be Soseki. This is an essay that he's written and a speech that he's giving to students. But he's talking about himself. He shares anecdotes about himself to help explain what he means by my individualism. And of course, his path through life regarding how he got to his philosophy or his ideas about my individualism and led to his own flourishing life. Talk about setting really quick. This is at Gakushuin University. What is interesting about Gakushuin University? Well, it's a fairly elite university. As a matter of fact, this is the university where the imperial family is educated. So we know that Soseki is speaking to uh, the elites of society, right? These people are going to be the leaders of society. So that might stay in the back of our minds as we're reading and understanding this essay by Soseki. The plot. What is the plot? What is his thesis or what's happening in this? Well, he's arguing about the role of individualism, this ideal of individualism, ultimately this Western Enlightenment ideal of individualism and its role in living a flourishing life. He uses, again, himself as an example and how he had to navigate through this ideal of individualism to get to his flourishing life where it is uh, in 1914. I think where we're going to spend a lot of time, though, today is talking about the themes. So let's talk about the themes here. What is, of course, individualism? What is this thing called individualism? Well, this is what I love about this essay is that Soseki spends so much time really getting clear on what he means by individualism. And even more so, what he doesn't mean by individualism. So let's get to that. I'm going to skip a bit to the end really quick here, just so that we get a better idea about what he doesn't mean by individualism. Why is it important to do this? Well, in any essay, you know there's going to be people who disagree with you. This is what I love about Soseki. He recognizes that. He recognizes that a lot of people are going to disagree with what he has to say. Therefore, how are you going to deal with that? How do you deal with the fact that so many people are going to disagree with you? You have to address them. And you have to try to convince the other side. And you have to try to say, I understand where you're coming from. But try, please, to understand where I'm coming from, too. I think that's a valuable skill, not just for Soseki, but I think that might be a valuable skill for so many of us, certainly in uh, the political climate that I find myself in in New York City in America in 2020. My goodness. But I love that Soseki does that. So let's 
jump to uh, page 43. And where am I reading this from? I'm reading this from the journal uh, Monumenta Nipponica from 1979. Why am I choosing this journal to uh, read this essay from? Because this journal, if you do have access to a library database, journal resources, uh, it's fairly accessible. Now, if you want to go find it, uh, a public uh, published version, paper and ink version of this, there's plenty of uh, reprintings of this. But online, if you do have access to library databases and journal databases, this is very easily accessible. So that's why I'm using this uh, 1979 edition translated by Jay Rubin, who's a very prominent uh, Japanese translator. So let's jump to page 43 here. Many people seem to think of individualism as something opposed to, even destructive of nationalism. But individualism in no way justifies such a misguided, illogical interpretation. That's interesting because he already knows that there's going to be people who say, wait a second, you're talking about this selfishness. And if, every, if you're proposing that everybody becomes selfish, isn't the nation going to fall apart? Sosek, he says, no way. As a matter of fact, nationalism and individualism can go together. You think they're at loggerheads with each other. In fact, I'm saying they go together very nicely and work together very nicely. Let me explain how. So a little bit further down on the same page. Many of them will go as far as to assert that our nation will perish unless this terrible individualism is stamped out. What utter nonsense. We are, in fact, all of us nationalists and internationalists and individualists as well. I love that. Because what is Soseki saying right there? He's really clarifying what he means by individualism. Individualism and nationalism go together. Furthermore, individualism, nationalism, and internationalism all go together. That's very interesting for Meiji era Japan because I said earlier that many Japanese looked around and acknowledged that they were technologically backwards, that they needed to catch up technologically and scientifically speaking. How do you do that? You need somebody to teach you the technology. You need somebody to teach you the science. Where are you going to get such teachers? Internationally, that's where. And Soseki acknowledges that. So his individualism is not, I am an island. Rather, his individualism is, I am one person in a nation. And not just one person in a nation, I am one person in a globe. I am an individualist and an internationalist and a nationalist all at the same time. If we read a bit further down, this is what I love, where he goes even further. The individual's liberty contracts when the country is threatened and expands when the nation is at peace. This is all very obvious. Why is it so obvious? Because Soseki isn't proposing an all or nothing kind of philosophy. He doesn't say individualism at all costs, nationalism at all costs. Rather, he's saying, come on, let's be obvious here. Sometimes you need to be more individualistic. When we're at peace, I don't need to be a nationalist. When our nation is being attacked or our nation is at war, of course, our liberty contracts and I have to contribute to the nation. That's obvious, isn't it? Now, of course, what is this leaving out? Here we are in 2020. Soseki is writing in 1914. Well, what's obvious that we know that Soseki doesn't know is there's this little thing called World War II when Japanese ultra-nationalism takes over. How would he appeal to that? He doesn't really address that because he didn't foresee any of that. He did foresee, of course, the need for a nationalism when the nation is under attack. And he did, however, see a need for individualism when a nation is at peace. How does that uh, square? What would Soseki say about World War II and pre-World War II Japan? Well, yeah, you might want to examine that a little bit further. I think that's an interesting direction to go in and analyze I'm not quite sure where he might go. What do you think? However, 
he does say on the next page, on page 44, the nation may well be important, but we cannot possibly concern ourselves with the nation from morning to night as though possessed by it. What is he talking about here? He's speaking in a very, I think, enlightened way such that we need balance, don't we? Isn't that what a flourishing life is? To find balance between something like this nation and individualism. Of course that's what it means. Of course that's the flourishing life. Find that balance. And of course the challenge is, where do we find that balance? How does Soseki suggest we find that balance? Well, he repeats what he started on page 43. Let's go to page 45 now, where he actually brings this out. This country of ours is in no danger of suddenly collapsing. We are not about to suffer annihilation. And as long as this is true, there should be no need for all this commotion on behalf of the country. I'm skipping down a little bit further. When war does break out, of course, and then I skip further. Naturally, we should turn our attention to the nation. Thus, I'm at the bottom of that paragraph now. Thus, I do not for a moment believe that nationalism and individualism are irreconcilable opposites engaged in a constant state of internecine warfare. Clearly, Soseki's pushing forward this idea of individualism individualism and nationalism going together very nicely. They're not opposed to each other. Let's take that even a step further then. Throughout, I'm going to use these uh, uh, ideas to explain even what he explained earlier in the essay and elsewhere in the essay. His individualism isn't about selfishness. Soseki's individualism is an individualism of ethics. He clearly shows that he understands, I'm on page 38 now, he clearly shows that he understands that to appreciate my own individualism, I have to appreciate the individualism of other people. I love at the top of page 39, where Soseki, now I'm getting a little bit intertextual connection here, uh, Soseki reminds me of Spider-Man, right? What did Spider-Man say? What did Uncle Ben tell Spider-Man? With great power comes great responsibility. And Soseki agrees with that. Soseki says, with great power comes great responsibility at the top of 39. Properly speaking, there should be no such thing as power that is unaccompanied by obligation. Obligation is ethics. Obligation is obligation to other people. Soseki recognizes that individualism isn't about being an island. Individualism is about living in society. And I find my individualism when I find my obligations to other people. That's a very interesting kind of individualism that Soseki's speaking about here. What is this obligation that Soseki speaks of? Well, let's turn the page back of one more to page 38. First, you will be unhappy for life unless you press on to the point where you discover work that suits you perfectly and enables you to develop your individuality. Second, that if society is going to allow you such regard for your own individuality, it only makes sense for you to recognize the individuality of others and to show a similar regard for their inclination. We have to respect others, Soseki says, and respect others' individualism. Going back to Soseki's notion of internationalism, let's jump ahead to page 40 now, because here he shows his debt to England in, and illustrates what he meant by that internationalism. In fact, Soseki was educated for a time in England. Why? Because Japan gave money to promising students to go study overseas, go learn about English literature, and that's where Soseki went. And Soseki illustrates his indebtedness there by talking about England on page 40. Let me change the subject for a moment. England, as you know, is a country that cherishes liberty. 
There is not another country in the world that so cherishes liberty while maintaining the degree of order that England does. I'm not very fond of England, to tell you the truth. As much as I dislike the country, however, the fact is that no nation anywhere is so free and at the same time so very orderly. Japan can't begin to compare with her. But the English are not merely free. They are taught from the time they are children to respect the freedom of others as they cherish their own. Freedom for them is never unaccompanied by the concept of duty. Nelson's famous declaration, England expects every man to do his duty. That shows this, not just Soseki's notion of individualism, but also his notion of internationalism and his indebtedness to England by saying, look at this, nobody is telling you to be absolutely selfish. Individualism comes from duty. So one of these original questions that I asked at the beginning was about modernity. Was what? What is my place in the world? How do I find my place in the world? Soseki suggests you find your place in the world by discovering what makes you happy and what makes you happy should be giving your duty to others and finding your obligation for others, to others. It's not a pure hedonism. And that, to me, is a fascinating individualism. By the way, now let's talk about the dark side of individualism. Soseki is clearly, actually, to me, he's a precursor even of the French existentialists, especially Jean-Paul Sartre, much later. Jean-Paul Sartre, in his existentialism is a humanism, explains freedom. Jean-Paul Sartre suggests, suggests that freedom is accompanied by anguish and abandonment and despair. Well, that doesn't sound like a fun freedom, doesn't it? However, what's the value of freedom? Once you overcome that anguish, Sartre suggests, and Soseki as well, once you overcome that abandonment, Soseki speaks a lot about his path and how he felt lonely and his anguish of not knowing what to do and his despair of saying, what is my place in the world? I think that is the problem of freedom. Soseki predates Sartre. This is written in 1914. Sartre wrote his Existentialism as a Humanism in 1945, France. And yet here's Soseki expressing many of those same ideas. And so on page 42, Soseki writes, Sometimes, in some instances, we cannot avoid becoming scattered. That is what is lonely. How many of you feel this despair of freedom when you have so much freedom? Doesn't that bring us despair? It certainly brings me despair and anguish and abandonment. Because with so much freedom, I realize, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. What am I to do? And that's exactly where Sartre went with these existentialist writings in mid-century France. Soseki is saying the same thing with freedom. This is hard. This is despair. How do I go about living my life? How do I go about choosing and knowing what makes me happy? Oh my goodness, that's a question for the ages, isn't it? Well, at least it's a question for modernity. A modernity where freedom and individualism are given to the people. How many of us sometimes do wish, just tell me what to do. I wish you could just tell me what to do. Well, in real life, you have to figure it out on your own, don't you? And that does cause a lot of stress. But what it seems to me that Soseki is suggesting here is you'll get a lot less stress 
if you can understand that individualism isn't all about you, but also about the society around you, about the obligations that you have to others, about your duties to others. And when you see your individualism that way, you might be able to turn yourself around and say, ah, what can I do for society? And that will make me happy to a certain degree, won't it? You have to find that balance though. Because being forced to do some job that you don't like, well, you won't do that job very well, will you? But how hard is it to find what makes you happy? And then finally get somebody to give you a job that makes you happy at the same time. Oh my goodness. The despair of the ages, the despair of freedom, the despair of modernity. And that's what Soseki is addressing in this essay. And I find it beautiful for that reason. Because these are the same despairs that I feel uh, a lot, a lot lately, especially in this crazy 2020. Let's talk a bit about the structural and formal elements of this essay. One thing that really sticks out to me, especially at the beginning of this essay, and Jay Rubin in his translator's introduction to the essay even suggests this, that I love, that Soseki rambles. Now you'll forgive me. You've seen a couple of my talks so far. I tend to ramble. I, I, I understand the rambling nature. And we see that Soseki rambles as well. At the beginning, oh, well, listen, I was scared about this talk. Somebody invited me. I don't know what business I have talking at this school. Uh, so I started to paint. How many of you have had some sort of task put upon you? And then you go and do the exact opposite. Go do something else. Uh, I think they call that procrastination sometimes, don't they? And so Seki acknowledges that he's a procrastinator. I love that. However, how does that work within the rest of the central themes about individualism in this work? I think they work very well, in fact. Because isn't that how life is? And that's how he describes his life until he found his place in society as a writer. Isn't that what we do? I could, I, that's what I've done. I've rambled. Took this job, then that job, then another job. Until I found what I was really about. What was really for me. That's difficult to find, isn't it? And until we do find that, isn't it all just a rambling mess? Unfortunately. How much of us, how many of us, have lived life in a rambling manner, not having found the individualism that Soseki's talking about. And so while I find it humorous and playful, his rambling nature, I think it works perfectly for this essay, doesn't it? Especially for the beginning of the essay. That he's rambling. Because we're all rambling until we find our place until we find our individual role in society, until we find our individual obligations and duties to everybody else. We ramble just like Soseki did at the beginning of this essay. I've already talked a little bit about intertextual connections. Of course, we could connect this to so many other of Soseki's great works. Jay Rubin does at the beginning of his introduction, talking about many of Soseki's other works, for example, I've mentioned already that Spider-Man intertextual connection that I really like though, right? With great power comes great responsibility, but also the Jean-Paul Sartre a few decades later. Soseki seems like this pre-existentialist, this pre-French existentialist that I find brilliant. He also references Henri Bresson in the essay, who is a precursor to the existentialists, in fact. So Soseki recognizes his place in this, although he didn't see uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, who died before Jean-Paul Sartre came onto the scene, he saw his place in international literature, talking about Henri Bergson in the essay a little bit. The last thing that I want to mention about my own personal reflection with this, now many things really resonate with me, the despair of freedom, 
the loneliness of freedom, the anguish of freedom, the difficulty yet finding my place in being obligated to other people. That certainly speaks to me. However, on page 32, I love this line. He says, at university, I majored in English literature. What exactly is English literature, you may well ask. I myself did not know the answer to that after three years of furious study. Now I'm jumping at the bottom of that paragraph. For three years I studied, and at the end I still did not know what literature was. This, I might say, was the source of my agony. Well, I've studied Japanese literature for a little bit more than three years now. I've been teaching Japanese literature for a little bit more than three years now. I don't know what Japanese literature is. I ask myself, what is even this thing called Japan? And I hope that that question lingers with you because it's certainly lingered with me in the same way that it's lingered with Soseki here. That at the end of this talk, I still don't know what Japanese literature is. Certainly don't know what English literature is. I don't know what Japanese culture is. As a matter of fact, the more I study it, the more I realize I don't know any of this. And I'll tell you what, that's what I love about studying this stuff. Is it teaches me how little I actually know about anything and how little I understand. And it humbles me to look around the world and say, wow, there's so much more to learn. There's so much more to understand. And I think that's where Soseki is going. And if he's not going there, fine. That's where I'm going. I don't understand Japanese literature. But I hope you'll go with me a little bit further and we could maybe not understand it together. Until next time, bye-bye.